All right, thank you very much for joining us today. We welcome you to our monthly webinar series. As mentioned, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate director of the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment here within the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Who are we? We are a group of faculty, professors, and students working together to take on the major challenges of subsurface energy in the environment. We work on a wide variety of different topics. We have a range of different affiliates programs and opportunities to collaborate and work directly with us. And we do welcome the opportunity to collaborate and work with individuals and organizations to take on these major challenges. Now go ahead and tune in. Let me just advertise right now and tune in with, with us next month. And we'll have a discussion by Dr. Kami Sepinori talk about multi-purpose reservoir simulators. We look forward to that. That's on March 5th, and we'll be having these every month, the first Friday of the month at 12 p.m. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the one that we have here for you today. We're very fortunate to hear from Associate Professor John Foster. He is a professor who conducts research on experimental and computational mechanics and scientific machine learning, a really important topic right now, a lot of attention around this, multi-scale modeling too. He's appointed within the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Engineering and also within the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, all within the Cockrell School of Engineering here with us at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also a core faculty member over at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences and the co-founder founder and CTO of Datum, a tech-enabled professional education company for energy data science and machine learning. And I work with him directly with on that um, education company. All right, I don't wanna keep going here. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Foster so we can hear from him. All right, Dr. Foster, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, like Michael said, he is a close collaborator of mine, both in research uh, at the University of Texas at Austin and through our company who he co-founded with me, Datum. So today I'm going to talk about kind of a high level talk, show and tell, if you will, because a lot of uh, people probably don't understand this topic or what we mean by scientific machine learning. So I'm going to try to, you know, my goal for this talk is to, uh, when you come, when you come away from it, you have a clear understanding of what scientific machine learning is. And we'll discuss a couple of applications uh, that we've worked on in petroleum engineering. But we're just kind of getting started in this area. And, and so what, what I'll show you is, is just the beginning and kind of scratch the surface of things to come. Um, there is a question and answer, uh, or there's an opportunity to ask questions via the chat for these live webinars. However, there is a, a slight delay. And so it's a little bit difficult to answer the questions in real time. So I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and when you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box uh, at the time and I've built in time uh, during this hour. Uh, I plan to finish hopefully within about 45 minutes uh, so that you know, I have plenty of time to answer questions as they come in at the end. So uh, scientific machine learning, it's kind of a, a new term um, and I'm gonna I have a slide coming up later that really gives credit to the people that have done a lot to uh, promote this terminology and I, I think it is important to have kind of a uniform terminology uh, here you know an, an umbrella term to discuss what we mean or a clear understanding of what we're talking about when we say scientific machine learning because that will help us all um, kind of unify the literature so that you know it's easier to find um, and collaborate with other people who who are doing similar work right so uh, over here, you know, on one side we have the kind of traditional realm of engineering, uh, and that is, you know, solving ODEs and PDEs, um, you know, and, and we could think of like reservoir simulation in the context of petroleum engineering as one application of that. And then over here on the other side we have statistical estimation, right? And you know, these days neural networks, so that's uh, you know they get a lot of a lot of attention and credit, and so that's why. I put that figure there, but it doesn't necessarily limit it to, to neural networks, um, but any any type of statistical inference. Um, and, and at the intersection of those two is what, you know, I mean by scientific machine learning. 
And I have some, you know, ex explicit examples coming up. Let's look at those here. So one is probably the most naive um, way, and that is that we would use, we could use engineering simulation tools that solve ODEs and PDEs to generate synthetic data that we could use for, that we could then build a machine learning model on top of, right? So when we do machine learning, in a way, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just a kind of, um, uh, I'll probably get some heat for this, but it's, it's just a fancy term for, for optimization, right? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I know that, you know, machine learning is a little bit broader than that because it encompasses all the tools that we use and, and um, you know, tools that we also use to, to validate those models and other things. It's not just simply the optimizers themselves. But, you know, ultimately we are interested in, you know, if we have uh, data U, then we're interested in finding an estimation of U given, you know, parameterized by some parameters theta. And the goal of that is to, to minimize some norm quantity and the difference between the data and the estimation of U and minimize it with respect to the parameters of you, right? And so what we could do here then is, is use uh, engineering simulators to generate synthetic data for a machine learning model. And there's multiple reasons to do that. Perhaps we're, we're trying to, to build some coarse grained model uh, so that we would use uh, engineering simulation tools to generate fine scale data that's too computationally expensive to solve, you know, say at a, at a reservoir scale, you, you know, if you would imagine uh, you had some engineering simulator that modeled every facies in a rock, well, you're not going to solve that problem at a reservoir scale, but you could solve it at small scales and then build up coarse grained solutions or statistical estimations of those models, statistical representations of those models, and then use those models in perhaps a, a large scale, uh, you know, reservoir simulation type model. So this is kind of one application of scientific machine learning, and it's, it's probably the easiest. And, and quite frankly, this has been around a, a long time. People have been doing this kind of work for, for a really long time. Additionally, uh, you know, a few years ago, this the notion of physics-informed neural networks was coined. And the idea behind this type of thing, so and typically, if you notice the first term, is identical to up here, uh, to the term uh, up here, right? And this is kind of the standard loss function for a machine learning model, right? We have some data and we have some estimation based that's parameterized with theta, and we want to minimize that, find the theta that, that forces this to be a minimum. Um, but what we can do in, in a physics informed neural network is, and, and I guess, you know, the neural network implies that this U hat would be a neural network. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily have to be. You know, I'm kind of uh, lumping those, you know, other types of regression algorithms in there. Um, and what we're going to do with the loss function is we're actually going to add a regularization term that is the balance law itself, right? So this would be, you know, u hat prime minus f of u. So this is this is some type of differential equation, right? And if and if f of u uh, also could involve, um, you know, derivative. I'm implying that this uh, prime here is a time derivative, but if f of u also has spatial derivatives in it, then this could be a PDE in of itself. And and that's kind of been what's been demonstrated um, in the literature thus far is, you know, basically putting conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, balance laws as regularization terms in the loss function. Um, the one thing to note with those types of models is you also have to add the boundary conditions. And while uh, these types of models can be used to, you know, find the solution of the differential equation, if you will, um, they're only valid for the boundary conditions that are uh, also imposed in the loss function. So if you wanted to solve, you know, essentially the, the same governing equation for a different set of boundary values, you'd have to retrain the network. And given that these um, minimizers, the typical minimizers for neural networks are often first order stochastic minimizers, the, the training is, takes way longer than it would to just solve the differential equation outright with standard techniques, right? 
Um, so, so you know, I've got some more discussion about physics and forum networks, uh, neural networks coming up. Um, another another idea would be this so-called uh, that that's been recently in the literature a lot is these so-called neural differential equations, where basically you have your time derivative term that you would integrate with a standard time integrator, and then you have the 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 right hand side would be represented uh, with a neural network again. The theta here is the, the parameters of the neural network, which represent, you know, as we'll see later, the weights and biases you know, and other, uh, other things, terms from the, from the neural network, right? And then finally, uh, you know, this last one is kind of the most recent term that I've been aware of, made aware of, and that is these so-called universal differential equations. And with a universal differential equation, the right-hand side would have uh, a function of u, and this this function could be a differential operator in itself. So the differential operator could uh, operate on u, uh, but it could also operate on any estimation of, of that involves u. So it could be perhaps a constitutive model, or, or perhaps um, the neural network represents the differential part of the differential operator in and of itself. Okay. So I have a fun example. To get us started here, we'll we'll move on to some petroleum engineering examples later. But I, I just couldn't resist the opportunity to present equations with emojis in them. Uh, it, it's just too fun to pass up. And and but more than that, it it really is a, a nice example because the dynamics are easy to understand. So this is the the uh, Lotka Volterra equations that represent species dynamics. And so the idea here is that you know the time rate of change of, of you know, uh, um, what would sort of be an initially a, an ecological um, scenario that's in equilibrium, the time rate of change of rabbits, uh, for example, if beta were zero, then the, the rabbits would increase exponentially, right? So the rabbit growth is, um, is deterred by the fact that the rabbits can be eaten by foxes, right? <clears throat> and likewise, uh, the fox growth, if there was an inf infinite supply of rabbits, the, f the fox growth would as well grow exponentially. However, the, <clears throat> the you know, eventually uh, the rabbits, uh, the foxes eat enough rabbits such that there's not enough food for all the foxes and then they begin to die off. And so you have this kind of cycl cyclical behavior uh, in which the dynamics are quite easy to understand. However, you know, what, what is difficult to, to know in a real ecological scenario is what are these interaction terms? You know, exactly how do the foxes and rabbits interact? Because uh, there's a lot of factors that can play into that. And so if, if we don't exactly know what those interaction terms should be, <clears throat> you might think that you could replace those, you know, um, uh, absolute expressions with unknown neural networks parameterized by some unknown parameters theta, right? So the inputs to these neural networks would be the population, the current, you know, the current populations of rabbits and foxes, uh, and then you could fit or, you know, uh, uh, optimize the theta to some data, right? And that's exactly what these guys did, uh, Christopher Crocus and the group at MIT, um, and, and they showed this really nice example, right? So uh, I really like this problem because you have these really nice like oscillations and there's absolutely no way that if you replace the entirety of the right-hand side of those equations with a neural network that you could extrapolate outside the training data and capture all of this oscillatory behavior. So again, what you see here is that to the left of this vertical line, just this small amount of initial data was used to train or parameterize those neural networks and those equations. And then beyond that, once, once they were parameterized, beyond that, they have an ability to extrapolate outside the range of the data quite well, which we, we you know, anybody who's familiar with neural networks know that they interpolate really well, but don't always extrapolate well. And here's an, a great example where, where, they, um, where they do, right? And uh, so I also want to give credit to uh, Chris Rakakis and the group at MIT who were primarily in the Julia programming language community, 
for really promoting this term SciML. And uh, they, they've registered a website, SciML.ai. You can go have a look there and see all the interesting things that they're doing. And uh, I'll have more to say about Julia uh, in the future here. Um, another thing I really like from their paper is, uh, is you know, if you look at, uh, it's on the archive there, you can find it, but, you know, they, they have this right in the abstract, uh, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a model is worth a thousand data sets. And, and I firmly believe this, right? Um, and I often tell my students that all of engineering is just four equations, right? Conservation, mass, momentum, energy, and the, and the second law of thermodynamics. And all of the research we do is really just in um, discovering, parameterizing the uh, constitutive closure laws, and then creating solution techniques, often numerical solution techniques, to solve those equations. And so, you know, if if the equations, we know the equations work, well, can we embed the structure of those equations into our machine learning models, you know, use what we know works and, and reduce the parameter space by orders of magnitude uh, and, and only, you know, only use neural networks or statistical estimation, you know, on things that we, we sort of don't know. And a lot of times that is, you know, the constitutive closure laws and relationships. So just a little bit further motivation uh, is to, you know, where we're going and why we, we think these things might work. Well, let's just consider single phase flow. Uh, could it be sort of described as a convolutional neural network? Well, uh, everybody should, you know, any petroleum engineer will be recognized this equation, right? It's, it's uh, the pressure diffusivity equation for single phase flow in a, in a porous media with small compressibility. <clears throat> And often when we solve this equation, you know, it's a partial differential equation, so often when we solve this equation in a, on a computer, we'll discretize the, uh, the, the spatial derivative, the spatial second derivative, the diffusion term over here, uh, with finite differences. So, I, so I've done that here, and, and, and then just rearrange the equation to put it in the form of those equations that we had earlier, where we have a time derivative on the left-hand side, and now we have, uh, you know, we've turned our PDE into an ODE, uh, that looks like this, right? And, and we have standard solution techniques for solving these types of equations. But let's let's look at uh, a, a convolutional neural network. And if you're not familiar with it, I have an example here uh, that, I, that I borrowed from uh, this reference here on the web. And, you know, the idea, it's often used, convolutional neural networks are used in image recognition. Uh, and, you know, the, what you do is you convolve this feet, this stencil over an image. In this case, the image is just represented by ones and zeros, and the stencil is also, in this case, represented by ones and zeros. And wherever, you know, the, the, the feature, um, whenever you, when you're, whenever you uh, pass this window function over the image, you know, wherever you have a one in the stencil and overlaps with a one um, in the image, then you would, then you would sum those, uh, you know, you sum those in, into this entry over here, right? So all the all the one entries get summed and you get four and you continue to pass this window over the image and, and you get this kind of structure, right? And so this so-called stencil here that we're, the, you know, passing this window function over the image in, in doing this, you could think of as just a, an arbitrary set of weights, right? So like this, right? Well, you know, kind of using this same idea, we could think of our uh, discretization of our diffusion term in the same way, where we have these weights, and the weights are, or our stencil in this case, is just, you know, one minus two, one. And of course, then uh, all this, this is just a constant out front, so you, you could also bring that inside, and, and you could imagine, you know, the whole, the whole thing, could, the whole right-hand side, even though I've written it like this, we have a constant out front, but Nevertheless, you could put that constant inside there because it would just be different by a constant factor. And the whole right set hand side could be represented as a, a, a neural network, right? So, um, you know, this is, you know, when you, when you train a neural network to solve these type of equations, effectively what you're doing is you're imposing some type of stencil that acts or learns, if you will, the differential operator uh, or the right-hand side of the equation in this in this case, right? So this is kind of a, a framework for how you might look at these things, okay? So we'll go ahead and look at a concrete example here. 
uh, and that is um, looking at the elastodynamics of heterogeneous materials. Right? So this is a one-dimensional example uh, to start, but the idea is that we, we have a bar, one-dimensional bar, and we're going to look at the wave dynamics of the bar, but the bar itself is heterogeneous. That is, uh, we look at it, we, you know, while we were interested in the wave propagation over the entire length of the bar, the bar is made up of a bunch of periodic unit cells that have alternating, uh, you know, stiffness. So you have like a dark region that would be stiff and a light region that would be compliant and we've parameterized it by the links and everything. It has this periodic structure. The reason we use this periodic structure is because in the paper, we also compare it to some analytic homogenization techniques. But uh, in terms of machine learning or computing, it's not really necessary to have the periodic structure. Um, but of course, you know, if you imagine that you were interested in wave propagation over long distances, like the size of a reservoir, or you know, which has implications for seismic interpretation, of course, then you know, we're not going to go down to the facies level and resolve you know, every change in facies in, in the model. It would be impossible to do that, even with the world's largest computers. So what we really you know, be interested in, oh, and I guess I should say, if it's, if it's not obvious, um, you know, if I do apply a dynamic load, or you can think of like I whack the end of the bar, right? If I, if I hit the end of the bar, or pull on the end of the bar dynamically, uh, this heterogeneity is going to cause wave reflections, right? Because there's an acoustic impedance mismatch between the materials, you're going to have, a, um, you're going to have waves that reflect and, and, and oscillate, which ultimately on the scale of the entire bar is going to cause dispersion, right? So when I talk about dispersion here, what I mean is that that the, the 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 wave speed is dependent upon the frequency, right? Now, often when we solve these equations, like with classical continuum mechanics techniques, right? So this is this is a classical PDE Cauchy momentum equation. This is just Newton's second law for you know written for infinitesimal quantities, uh, and with the constitutive model uh, for uh, you know. Uh, small scale elasticity or small displacement elasticity. Um, when we solve these equations, these equations do not have dispersion in them, right? I mean, you know, obviously when we solve them, we typically solve them in a computer and we might impose some numerical dispersion through our solution techniques. But the, the true exact solution to these equations do not have any dispersion in them, right? However, if we're, if we're interested in the dynamics over the entire link scale, then we really need to understand how the dispersion works. And, and we can't do that except to, you know, go down, uh, well, I say we can't do that with standard techniques without, you know, resolving every feature, right? And we're not interested in doing that. What we're interested in doing is something like this. We wanna, we wanna view the bar as a continuum, a homogenized continuum. We don't wanna resolve all of the small scale features, however, we still want the dispersive relationships to remain, you know, as close to reality as possible, right? And one way to do that is to use a non-local model. So non-local models um, are, do have dispersion, um, you know, th they are dispersive, they do disperse waves. And so this, this model that I present here is, is a model called paradynamics. Um, but as I have it written in this very simple form, you might notice that it's just uh, at least this term here, the term that replaces the divergence of stress in the classical theory is just convolution uh, with some kernel function here, right? And so the question is, can we learn, can we use the small scale dynamic behavior to learn the appropriate kernel function that preserves the large scale wave dispersion, okay? So that's that's the goal here. And without going into all the details, um, well, we can. And, and, and in this case, we just do it very naively. And there's nothing complicated at all about this. In fact, the, the, the representation of the kernel here is nothing more than, than uh, linear regression. We, we, we don't even use a neural network or anything complicated uh, to, to, to describe what it is. So what, what I'm showing here is, uh, the small scale fully resolved FEM solution, right? And so this is the displacement at the midpoint of the bar after it's been, you know, whacked on the end, if you think of it like that. Again, uh, without, without the small scale heterogeneity, 
this this initial pulse that is uh, imparted onto the end of the bar would remain that way as it travels through the bar, but the heterogeneity causes these oscillations, right? These this dispersive behavior, and these small small way these small higher frequency waves will travel faster, so they'll run to the end of the bar, reflect, interact with this, and eventually you get lots of interesting dynamics, right? So in, in this case, what we what we did initially was just very naively. Uh, learned a kernel using linear regression, and we only used this very initial part of the, the training data, right? And uh, while I'm, I'm showing this, what you have to remember is what I'm plotting here is the displacement at the midpoint of the bar. So if you if you did plot the displacement at the very end of the bar or at the beginning of the bar where the wave begins from, uh, you know, the, the wave has passed through that uh, in the training data already. However, you know, the, the the wave dispersion uh, continues to uh, change throughout the the solution of the equations, right? So that uh, you know, it, it might be nice to actually view this in in an animation. Dynamically, you would see these waves running out ahead uh, faster than uh, the, the, this main pulse here. And so, very naively, um, we can get a decent match uh, by just doing that, by just learning the kernel. Okay. But we can take it a step further, and, and that's why if you notice here the blue line, which is the learned solution, uh, it says without constraint. So let's talk about what I mean by that. What we can do, because we do know some of the microstructure, is we can impose a physical constraint on the objective function. So in addition to just having the objective function be the data and the estimator, where the estimator is the solution of the homogenized, dif you know, integral differential equation in this case, uh, we can add a term that we call an energy constraint because effectively that's what it is. But it, it you know, it imposes it imposes that the small scale heterogeneous energy is equivalent to the homogenized energy over any unit cell, and so we add this term right here, this constraint term, to the objective function, and then do the same thing that we did before, and we get a much better solution, right? Uh, well, I say much better, but we get a better solution, right? And, and every, you know, everything the same, the only thing we did different was we added this uh, term here uh, to the objective function in the learning, okay? You can also see that, you know, it, basically what we have here is the test error, that's the holdout data, that's the the difference in the, the true solution, the, the small scale fully resolved finite element solution and the homogenized solution to the right of that vertical line of the testing data, right, of, of the training data. So outside the training data, this is our test error. And what we see is that the more training data we use, well, you know, if we, if we use a lot of training data, then the, whether we use the constraint or not doesn't really matter, okay? But for a small amount of uh, training data, the use of the constraint really improves the accuracy of the model. Right? So that, that's what we see here. Um, we can also do this in two dimensions. So in, in, in two dimensions, we have a unit cell that looks like this, and we, we tested various unit cell representations. But in this case, you, you, you have a, a stiff region surrounded by a, a compliant inclusion. And in two dimensions, uh, the, the, you know, the difference is, is more noticeable, right? So uh, over here, the, the small scale fully resolved solution uh, is represented by the, the orange line and, and the blue line um, is just the naive learning without any kind of energy constraint. And if we uh, impose the, the energy constraint on the model, then we get a much better representation of the wave dynamics. And you see in both cases, in the training data, they're, they're both really accurate, right? So the, in the training data, they, they work well, and it's really, you know, outside the training data uh, where you see the big difference because, again, we've imposed um, some type of physical constraint, uh, which helps to, you know, get a better estimation of what the true kernel is, and 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 um, and then we can, you know, preserve the wave dynamics. So, so that's one example uh, with respect to wave propagation that could have, again, uh, you know, um, applications in seismic interpretation. My next example is, uh, you know, I, I think if, if you're a petroleum engineer and you went through a petroleum engineering curriculum and you took some courses in reservoir engineering, if you didn't learn anything else, you probably learned the Buckley-Levitt problem, right? 
So uh, certainly here in our uh, UT curriculum, we, we have three courses in res reservoir engineering, and I think the Buckley Lever problem is covered in all three of them to some extent. So, uh, you know, Buckley Lever problem is used to uh, often used to validate codes uh, because it does have a semi analytic solution. Uh, what we have here is if we were to write for for a two phase, um, you know, oil and water two phase model, uh, if we were to write the total mass balance and then the mass balance of water, you'd have, an, you know, these two equations where we're going to use standard rel relative permeability model um, for the fluxes. And then ultimately things can reduce down to where everything can be parameterized by this fractional flow equation here. And after some assumptions like incompressibility and other things, you can reduce this down to uh, a simple equation that can be solved again semi-analytically. Right? And so, uh, you know, this is kind of our, our motivating problem for what we're going to talk about here. And we're going to look at physics informed neural network solutions of this problem, right? And it's and it's nice to compare uh, the physics informed neural networks because again, we have a semi-analytic solution here. So just a, another refresher on what physics informed neural networks are, you know, here it's kind of a, a, a generic network architecture. We have some input layer, which would, could include the spatial dimensions, velocities, other things like that and time. Those are passed into one or more hidden layers. Ultimately, there's an output layer that estimates, uh, in this case, you know, the, the velocity U. And because we're doing this in the so-called physics informed uh, neural network, as part of our loss function, we also have these uh, generic differential terms, right? So, um, you know, the, the the time derivative with respect to U, the 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 um, divergence of U and the Laplacian of U. And then all of those are fed into the loss function along with the standard, um, you know, difference in the estimation and the data, any data provided. Uh, so with that, you know, if you're not familiar, each, each neuron in a neural network is just a simple linear combination of weights and biases, right? So what, the, the, the inputs that are passed into a, a, a neuron uh, are you know multiplied by some weights uh, summed up and then there's some offset or bias here and all of those are then uh, on, on upon output layer passed through some kind of activation function which because um, you know what, what on the interior here uh, these are just this is just a linear set of equations the activation function imposes some nonlinearity on there. Uh, so like typical activation functions would be like a tan H or a rectified linear unit, something like that. And if you have multiple hidden layers, then it's just a composition. So each layer, the, the dot represents the, the output from the previous layer is passed into the input of the next layer and so on, ultimately, to, to you have the, you know, the, the final output like this. OK, so uh, the guys at Stanford, Schleppi and others looked at this problem. Uh, the, this buckley lever problem um, in trying to solve it with um, physics-informed neural networks. And in, in fact, you can see the title of their paper is Limitations of Physics-Informed Machine Learning for Nonlinear Two-Phase Transport and Porous Media. So uh, what they discovered is that if you have uh, concave flux functions, this is your fractional flow, if you have concave uh, flux functions, then everything behaves well. But in reality, when we use the typical relative permeability models like the Corey Brooks model, we have convex flux functions that look something like this. And now all of a sudden things don't behave very well. And in fact, they, they had a difficult time getting these things to converge, um, which was surprising to them, right? Neural networks have this so-called universal approximation theory, uh, a theorem which basically says they should be able to approximate any function. Well, why can't they? Uh, approximate this simple one-dimensional equation. And it turns out it, it doesn't have really so much to do with the network architecture as it does to do with the loss function. And they investigated, you know, really large networks with thousands of parameters uh, with very little success in solving these problems. Uh, they also looked at convex loss functions and they have the same problem. The, the, the solution to that is a self-sharpening wave and it's not something we typically encounter, but, but nevertheless, they, they looked at it as well. Uh, so what, one thing they did to, to rectify the issue was to add this artificial diffusion term to the loss function. 
So the idea is that this equation uh, will return to the bucket lever equation and the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And so if you take very, very small epsilons, then, then you can get something that approximates the, the network well with this uh, flux function. Right? Uh, and also for the convex case as well, they, they were able to achieve that. Uh, finally, you know, you know, just to look at how things, so if you look at how the loss converges over iterations, you know, if you have large diffusions, well, then it converges ra rather rapidly. But as this uh, diffusion quantity approach, you know, this parameter approach approaches zero, then it slows down the convergence rate or even, you know, when it is zero, then you, you, you don't get convergence at all. So we, we decided to look at this from a different perspective and, and the so-called HP variational pins. And I'll try to, uh, you know, explain what, where the HP comes from and other things as we go. But the idea is, is similar. So we, we basically have these residual functions where this is a differential operator on the neural network and you have central boundary conditions, Dirichlet boundary conditions and initial conditions and all of those will go into the loss function. But instead of using the, the strong form of the equation, we go ahead and weaken it, right? So we multiply by a series of test functions. Uh, the test functions can be um, different from the trial space, which is a neural network. So now we're kind of in the context of finite elements here. Uh, and what you might think, view this as is like a petrov galerkin technique where you have different tri uh, trial functions. Uh, we, I'm sorry, different test functions. We integrate over the domain and, and we actually now use this integrated or weak residual um, in, in the solution of the pin, right? And that's why it's called a V-pin, variational pin. And the HP comes of the fact that we can um, basically have, we can break this integral into subdomains I and we can also have multiple uh, test functions. So the H refers to refinement of the subdomains and the P re uh, refers to refinement of the polynomial space of the test functions. Uh, the final loss function is this, and it looks kind of complicated, but basically, again, it's just this weakened residual of the balance law and the boundary conditions. And there are also these weights in here, which you know are two you know hyperparameters, if you will, that assign importance to you know the, the various terms in the loss function. Uh, it, I think in the examples we show, these are all one, so they could they could be removed from this equation. Again, just further, uh, uh, you know what we mean by oh, what we mean by H and P refinement. So again, uh, here this is this is two subdomains with five polynomials each. Uh, this is two subdomains with ten polynomials each. So this would be P refinement, and then over here we have H refinement. So we have we have um, five polynomials over now five subdomains. So that kind of uh, shows P refinement and H refinement in isolation there. With this technique, and again, uh, moving from the kind of generic form of the equations to show the actual, uh, the actual form of the residual equation we used uh, up here, this is the buckley lever equation again, um, you know, we, we show that you can get good results with this variational pen method. And, and we show for H and P refinement. And, uh, you know, of course, in, in HP methods, in the, in the context of finite element methods, um, you know, there's actually theory that talks about, you know, how to design optimal convergence in different norm spaces uh, given, you know, by modifying the number of subdomains in P. Uh, so you can design, you know, optimal convergence rates in whatever norm you'd like. We don't have any theory like that for for these methods uh, in the HP VINs, you know, VPN setting. Uh, but but you know, those are things uh, that we can look at in the future. So th so we did this very naively in this case, but we get we get decent results. Um, how, however, you know, one thing I want to point out is that well, this problem has an exact solution or semi semi analytical solution. And I can solve that semi-analytic solution thousands of times in the time it takes me to train the neural network once. And if I change the boundary conditions, I have to train the neural network again, right? Whereas if I change the boundary conditions, it's no problem for the for the forward solution. It takes, you know, uh, nanoseconds to solve. Right? So, uh, the, you know, it begs the question: Well, just because you can do this, why would you, right? And I think the next problem is far more interesting is can we solve an inverse problem in this framework, right? So if we're given data, 
can we find the fractional flow curve? Because that's the constitutive response, right? Uh, that's the thing that's unknown. That's that's a function of the relative permeabilities and other things. And so, in what uh, proceeds, I, I have we show two approaches, and we do this with fairly scattered data, sparse data, right? There's not a lot of data here. But the first thing we do, so this is uh, this is in the XT. These are points just randomly sampled in the XT domain, which you really could never do in, a, in an experiment. If you think about a 1D core flood, um, it's, it's very difficult to to sort of you know dig inside the core and see what 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 the saturations are at different x and t spaces but what is quite easy to do is 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 the is the next one right just, so if we just sample at the end of the core over all time so we just look at the saturations at the end of the core over time i mean this is this is essentially what we do in these core flooding experiments and, and it's it's quite straightforward so given that can we find the, cons the constituent response to fractional flow curve in this model? And, you know, again, now we have two neural networks. We have a neural network that is represents an estimation of the, the flux U, and we have a neural network, a different neural network that represents the fractional flow curve F, okay? We impose some other constraints now, one of them being that the data, so U must match this, the data, right? The, the, the saturation, it must uh, produce the right saturation where we have sample points. And the other thing is just the, the fractional flow curve has these constraints that, you know, at, at, at zero, at zero, and at the end, it's one, right? Uh, so with that, we use the same loss function that we had before for the, the, the the different the weakened differential equation plus the the boundary conditions uh but now we have these additional terms as well okay so now our loss function is this whole this whole thing and you know there there's the the answer right we, we this is what it makes this interesting we we can figure out what the constituent model is at the same time we find the solution to the differential equation right so the the, the part here is is interesting again we only have this, you know, very sparsely sampled saturations, but now we have a solution to the differential equation that can predict the saturation anywhere. And in addition to that, we have, you know, we know the constitutive model, right? So if we if we know the constitutive model, then we, we also, um, if we know the constitutive model, then we, then we also uh, could, um, sorry, it looks like my, Unfortunately, uh, yeah, I'm almost done, so we'll we'll try to finish it out here. I apologize for that. Uh, so th again, we we learned the constitutive model uh, using this approach, and we can do it with either sampling method works adequately well. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is just the computational considerations when you go to try to solve these types of problems, right? So. Uh, here, if you imagine, we're back to this kind of single flow setting, single phase flow setting again, where in this case, we're trying to figure out the constitutive model that could potentially be a function of pressure and certainly a function of space. You know, you could think of this as like the permeability of a single phase flow model. We have to, we have to find these parameters theta through the solution of a differential equation. That is, you know, this is our loss function. And we need to find the theta that minimizes this loss function, but we also have to solve the differential equation at the same time. And you know, typically, this, our our computational frameworks aren't set up to do this. You know, we 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 use abacus or some you know or a reservoir simulator to solve uh, to to solve the partial differential equation. Or if it's an ordinary differential equation, you go to the classical you know minpack or elso those type of you know, package solvers that have been around forever and written in Fortran and C. And, you know, we can't directly compute derivatives through those in the framework. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, for complicated neural networks, which we typically use these newer uh, neural network frameworks to do these types of problems. So, um, you know, the, the issue there is that, well, the neural network frameworks, which all have some type of automatic differentiation, right? So these these derivatives are computed automatically through the computer implementation of the chain rule, right? They're com they're computed automatically in these frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch, 
uh, Jax, and, and in the Julia world, Flux. I mean, of course, there's many more MXNet, Chainer. I mean, I could go, I could live a whole page that listed neural network frameworks here, but all of them have that in common uh, that they typically accelerate the computations on GPUs and they use automatic differentiation to compute these derivatives to train the weights and biases of the neural network, okay? And, and none of them uh, have the ability to, uh, you know, typically use our, our spatial discretization techniques like finite elements, finite differences, or, or you know, the, the stiffness, automatic stiffness switching and other things we do in time, you know, complex time derivative calculations. So we either have to rewrite the, all of that framework in, you know, all of that stuff in these frameworks or, you know, figure out something else. And what I'm going to show you next, I use JAX uh, to do, but but I'll also mention in the Julia world, uh, Julia is, you know, probably the the most comprehensive set of, of, auto, of differential equation solvers. And because of the interesting type system in Julia, you actually, if you write your code generically, you can compute derivatives through the solution of differential equations that are solved with the standard differential equation solvers in the Julia world. So Julia is very interesting in this technique. And what I'm going to show you next, though, is, is JAX. Uh, JAX is, uh, you know, if you're familiar with Python, then you've absolutely used NumPy and, and SciPy to do computations with. And what JAX is, is it's, a, it's, it's, it's NumPy and some of SciPy with GPU, TPU acceleration. So the computations can be carried out on accelerators, you know, uh, GPUs. All of the thing can be, everything can be just in time compiled to run on GPUs and TPUs, and you can automatically differentiate everything, right? And so, uh, you know, this is some actual code where this is a nonlinear Newton solver written in JAX that's compiled to run on a GPU. And the, not, the, the really neat thing here is like, look how simple this Newton solver is. I write my finite element code in residual form so that this function residual is a function of P. So if I put in the pressure, you know, if it's the exact pressure that solves the different equations, that residual will be zero, right? Well, I can compute the Jacobian or the tangent stiffness matrix of that with one function call in, in, uh, in JAX, just this Jacobian forward like this. Then I can just pass that right into uh, a linear solver to compute the update direction and then update and, and return, right? So this is one step of a Newton solver. You would do this until you meet some convergence criteria. I have the full code on my blog. So you, if you want to look at uh, johnfoster.pg.utexas.edu slash blog, you can download an entire finite element code for, for this problem that I'm showing you here that is completely written in JAX and has the ability to train neural networks that are in, embedded inside the solution of the PDE. Here, what we have is, you know, on the left, this is nothing more than just the solution to the forward problem, right? So uh, I give some boundary conditions, I think it's 15 and five on the ends. This is a steady state problem. The, the mobility function, uh, or you can think of it like permeability divided by the constant viscosity is spatially dependent. So it's this red line over here. And so if I put in this red line and I solve the problem via finite element method, I get this black line, okay? But now what I'm going to do with the same code is instead of, in, I'm going to solve the inverse problem. I'm going to use the black line as data, right? I know the pressure distribution. I don't know the mobility function. And I'm going to replace that with a neural network. And the neural network is going to be a very small neural network. It just has uh, a single hidden layer with four nodes and a tan H activation function. And everything works, pass it through again, refer all the details here on my blog, but basically I can train the neural network to reproduce the exact constitutive model that I use to generate the data. And, it, and it's very small, so it's interpretable. I can actually look at this thing and, and try to understand exactly what's going on. And the beauty of this approach, as opposed to the approaches of, of pins and vpins and other things, is that I can now, I, I, all I did was learn the constitutive model. So I can now take that constitutive model and I can solve different boundary value problems, right? Uh, so then I can, you know, I can change the boundary values. I don't need to retrain a new network or anything like that because I learned the constitutive model and the balance law is the balance law. Uh, and so there I can just pass in uh, different boundary conditions and, and get the exact solution. Again, the, the two methods here are comparing the, you know, the exact known 
um, mobility function with, with a neural network trained mobility function. So in summary, uh, you know, SciML models can learn with small data as we demonstrated. They can extrapolate uh, outside the training data well, and, and because they're small, often they can be interpretable. And, and so finally, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge the sponsors. Um, uh, we have a consortium on machine learning or digital reservoir characterization technology. These are the current members of that, along with uh, I got some additional funding from Sandia to work on the wave propagation problem that I presented. Uh, if you would like more information about Direct, uh, this is a, a, a project that has uh, four co-PIs, uh, Dr. Perch, who introduced me, myself, Dr. Kors, uh, Torres Verdon, and Dr. Van Hort. Um, and you can find out more information about joining, uh, if you're interested, our, our uh, consortium at direct.pg.utexas.edu. Uh, so with that, I'll end, and I apologize for the slide issue there at the end. I hope everyone can still see. Um, and at this point, I will go and use the remaining few minutes to answer any questions. First, first question is, uh, the Fox Robert ODE is quite easy. It has just two eigenmodes. I was wondering if there is a well-known successful ML example for a system with complex behavior, possibly a nonlinear system. Well, I, I think I went on to present at least the, that two-phase throw problem is quite nonlinear, and, and that, that shows uh, res good results. So that's, that's one example at least. Um, we we're also doing work in, in two dimensions and higher. I, I didn't present any of that work because, again, I intended this to be an, an overview talk, uh, a learning experience for everyone as much as anything. So I wanted to keep the example simple. Um, I would say a good model is worth a thousand data. Well, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, if a, um, it, you know, if a model is worth a thousand data or if a computational model is, is worth a thousand data sets, well, then an analytic solution is worth a thousand computational models. Um, so while we talked about machine learning and, and all of that a lot, I mean, I think it still matters. Um, it, it still matters a lot uh, to understand the underlying physics. SciML as presented here seems to be more like a PDE solver using neural networks as a basis function than ML. It's like you almost need to know the final answer or perfect form of the equation before you can use PIN. But in the real world, there are many problems where we don't have exact PDE, which in my opinion is how the data-driven can be more useful. The question is how, how many constraints should you apply in order to solve real-world problems? Well, the first part of your question, you're right. Uh, in the, the neural, you're using neural network basis as, an, as a PDE solver. I think I went on to say more that, you know, just because you can, you shouldn't do that because our typical PDE solvers use second-order solvers. They're very robust and fast. And it's really, uh, you know, and I agree with you. It, 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 you know, I think I would argue that we always know the PDE. Again, the ba the balance law is the balance law. It's the constitutive closure relationships that we often don't know, and and that's where the inverse type solutions that I presented there, both with the pin, and just embedding a neural network inside a standard PDE solver, uh, it, it can be useful in learning the constitutive closure relationships. The balance laws are the balance laws. They hold you know, the PDE holds, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the closure relationship that we don't know. So our H and P in the domain chosen by the network as well as the solution phase. Uh, no, in, in the examples I showed, no, we did it just kind of naively. We just in, increased uh, um, increased the number of subdomains in H uh, uniformly and increased uh, the, the number of P uniformly. There has been some uh, work in the literature that shows that uh, you can do that locally to avoid unnecessary computational expense. Again, you know, true HP methods in a finite element setting would use, uh, you know, would, would be used to design optimal techniques uh, for convergence in, in whatever norm you'd like. Are there any ways to use a commercial software program such as CMG or Abacus in this neural network framework for reduce order modeling? Unfortunately, not that I know of, because again, you have to, you know, the, the neural networks have thousands of parameters, right? Uh, typically, and even the smaller neural networks would have tens to hundreds that you need to optimize. And uh, and, and so, you know, finite differencing or uh, is, is not a typical approach you would use. Of course, CMG and Abacus or CMG certainly has history matching. And the way they do that is they, they compute adjoints. So you could do it in that framework, but it, it's, it's, it's far more uh, inaccurate 
than if you if you have the exact derivatives that are computed via automatic differentiation. So, um, you know, and also, you know, the, the all of the neural network libraries and frameworks, if you want to use those optimizers, the, the atom optimizers and all of that, you really need to be working in the neural network framework like PyTorch or something like that. And you just can't computationally pass those data structures through CMG or Abacus because they're written in Fortran uh, and, and they don't have the automatic differentiation built into it. 